Look, I... <laughs> we hope you're all coping okay in these very unusual situations we're in. But in times of uncertainty, isn't it great that we can rely on the scriptures for wisdom, advice and encouragement? So we're going to use our psalm for, for today as our call to worship and there'll be verses for you to join in. So let's come to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to our supplications. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. So let's try and remember those words this week. So as our world grows dark with fear, confusion, sickness and death, May the light of Christ break through the darkness and bring hope and compassion to us. So we light our Christ candle. Today you're going to be able to sing, so isn't that great? And our first hymn today is 142, God be, sorry, Glory Be to God the Father. God, you are near as the very air we breathe and the light around us, yet our thoughts are farthest reach for short of you. We yearn to reach you. We seek the light and warmth of your presence, for we are lost without you. Though we say you are near, we are lonely and alone. Let our desire be so strong that it will tear the veil that keeps you from our sight. Let your light penetrate our darkness to reveal to us the glory and joy of your eternal presence. As the fish gives himself to the sea, as the bird gives herself to the air, as all of life gives light, so may we give ourselves to you, O God. And yet, Lord, it is so easy for us to get overwhelmed by all that's happening in our world. We're so focused on our own needs that we're not aware of the needs of those around us, our neighbours, our work colleagues, our families. We've become self-centred and selfish while the elderly and disabled go without. Lord, forgive us. Help us to be more community-minded in this time of stress and confusion, we need your guidance and comfort. 
we are like the disciples in the boat, feeling that the waves are going to overwhelm us. And then we hear your voice, peace, be still. Lord, forgive our lack of faith and help us to trust you more completely. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, hear the good news that all who trust in Christ will have their sins forgiven and will receive eternal life. As you hold this faith, I declare that all of us are set free from our sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey kids, it's time for you now. If you're out of the room, you might like to come so you can see the TV. And uh, we have Alison today to share your story. Okay, being able to smell is a wonderful thing. It's a God-given gift. We all associate smells with particular events and particular times in our life. In today's reading, there, the author of that um, passage actually mentions a fragrance. So obviously that fragrance was a very important part of that event for them because they remembered it to write it down and felt it was important enough to tell us. What I'd like you to do is pause and I'd like you to share with one another what some of your favourite or important fragrances or scents or smells are. How we smell is actually a really complicated process. We take in air through our nose, where it gets filtered by the hairs in our nose, and then it gets warmed and it gets moistened. And then that air starts to touch the skin that's inside our nose. Then it sends messages to our brain. And our brains can actually remember over 10,000 different smells. That's pretty impressive. Smells are important because if we couldn't smell, our food would taste terrible. And sometimes it's important to let us know that things are happening. It might be that you know, there's something wrong with your car or maybe something's just getting too hot on the stove and your sense of smell is a warning of that. Now we're going to have some fun. Obviously, we don't have smell of vision So we're going to have to do this in a slightly different way. I'm going to give you some clues and I want you to see if you can guess what smell I'm thinking about. So here we go. Smell number one. It's to do with our theme for the year. You can eat it. It's got a hot, crusty smell. Have you worked it out? Yep, you're right. It's hot bread. Okay, let's go for something a little bit trickier. The air is hot and dry. The smell is coming from the trees. The trees have koalas in them. Reckon you've got it? Did you guess the bush or a eucalyptus tree? Yep, that's actually one of my favourite smells. Okay, last one. This one's a bit trickier. It's brown. Did you guess tea or coffee? Because you're wrong. It's hot. Tea or coffee is still wrong. You drink it with marshmallows. You got it? Yep, it was hot chocolate. Okay, this week's Bible reading tells us about a woman named Mary who gave Jesus a wonderful fragrant gift. Jesus was visiting the home of his friend Lazarus. While he was there, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, poured expensive perfume over his feet and then wiped his feet with her hair. She did this to say thank you to Jesus for healing her brother. The Bible tells us that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfumed oil that she used. Some found fault with Mary for using an expensive perfume in this way. But Jesus was, Jesus accepted that this was an important thing that she needed to do, that this was her gift to him, that this was her way of honouring and thanking him. So, there are many ways to honour God. 
what I'd like you to do now when I've given the instruction is to turn the video off again and think about some ways you can honour God with your sense of smell. Enjoying our senses, our smell, our taste, our sight, our hearing. These are all God's gifts to us and using them well and using them in his service is a way of honouring him, just the same way as Mary honoured Jesus by using the scent of the perfume. Now, by now, your parents should have received an email that has abracadabra. I'll get three yet. There we are, has have sent you three worksheets. If you haven't got those, if you can drop us a line and we'll email them to you and they will come as a part of the children's worship each Sunday from now on. Thank you. Well, kids, I hope you enjoyed that time with Alison. So it's time for our announcements. Now, we know that not all of you have email, but those of you who do, you will have received the uh, weekly notice sheet. And so we hope that you're praying for all of the things that are in there. There's not too many there at the moment, but um, at least that lets you know what's happening. For those of you who don't receive the news sheet, we're going to be trying to see if we can mail that to you. We don't want anyone um, to be missing out. But there is one really important thing that you need to do in preparation for next week because next week is Palm Sunday. Well, actually, two things you can do. Palm Sunday is next Sunday, and we're going to be celebrating communion. So in your family groups or if you live alone, you might like to have a little bread roll or some, a little piece of bread and some juice ready so that when we do communion, all of us are able to participate in that. It is our communal meal, and even if we're scattered, we can still uh, participate. So that's the first preparation. And secondly, um, if you've got a palm tree or maybe even a fern that looks like a palm, you might like to um, have that available, especially if you've got kids, because um, it'll be really fun to, to imagine that we were there on that Palm Sunday. Now, our family cross, we've been ensuring that that uh, is still uh, being given and this week we'd like to give it to David Harris and what we'll do is we've got a beautiful picture of the cross in the chapel and we'll send David um, that, that picture. So let's prepare ourselves to hear the message as we listen now to our scriptures. Our first scripture reading today is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 12 verses 7 to 23. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have him killed with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbors. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. The Lord struck the, Lord, the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became very ill. 
David therefore pleaded with God for the child. David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his house stood before he, beside him, urging him to rise from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat the food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we tell him the child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, he perceived that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David rose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house, and when he asked, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing you have done? You fasted and wept for the child when it was alive, but when the child died, you rose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me, and the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. This is the word of the Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought, bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. That is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to worship again with us. Uh, we want to thank you for all your feedback and your encouragement this week. Uh, last week we put the service together in a couple of days. This week we've had a little bit more time as we start to get into this rhythm. I want to say a special thank you to all our worship team who are here. There's nine of us, I think we counted. We're under the limit. And especially to Neil and Reverend Glenn for their audio production. Um, it's been a big effort to get things going, so I want to say a special thank you to them. So let's pray together. Living Christ, it is in you that we live and move and have our being. And so as we come together around your word, some of us here present and others in our homes, we pray that we might know the unity of your spirit, speaking to us, being with us, and, and um, opening the word to us. So we pray, living Christ, that you would make yourself known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are less than two weeks away from Good Friday and with everything going on in the world, it's hard to believe that this is where we are. 
And in the northern hemisphere, uh, if we lived there, the, the season of Lent moves from darkness into light. Their days are getting longer, their nights are shorter, their weather's getting warmer. But in the southern hemisphere, we're moving from light into darkness as our nights get longer, as our weather becomes cooler. And next Sunday is Palm Sunday, where we will celebrate the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem and the final week of Jesus' life and his horrific, horrific death. And so as we enter into greater isolation this week, as we experience more shutdowns, there is a sense that we are moving into a darkness, a social, a physical, a, a emotional, a financial darkness. And so this is truly a Lenten experience for us. It's in the season of Lent that we strip things back, things that are unnecessary, and get back to the core of what our faith is all about. But we're finding at the moment that our lives are being stripped back of things that are really important to us. Things like being with each other. Some of you for, uh, have lost work and employment. We've lost our routines. And of course, we've lost our fellowship. All things that are really, really important to us in our faith. And so Lent is a time to experience what it is to get back to who we really are in Christ. And so I want to encourage you that in your dealings of your own griefs and losses, you might hold on to hope. And our theory of atonement today will do that for us. Uh, it tells us that the cross is a sign of resurrection and hope, that death is not the end, but something new is about to come. So over the season of Lent, we've been looking at the question, why did Jesus have to die, as we reflected on the meaning of the cross. And you may remember that within the pages of the New Testament, those early disciples tried to grapple with what the cross meant. And this is our fifth week of Lent, so we've looked at different theories of atonement, and we've looked at them, the scriptures that have clustered around particular images. On the first week, we looked at um, the passages that clustered around the legal system, and um, what it meant to make, be made right with God. In Lent 2, we looked at the language of the battlefield as those early disciples saw soldiers going off to war. There was a, a, a way of understanding that the cross was a sign of victory over evil. And then in week 3, we looked at the language of sacrifice around the cult of the worship temple and, and the idea that Jesus was made the sacrificial lamb that put an end to all scapegoating and all sacrifice. And then last week, you'll remember, we looked at uh, the approach of atonement through personal relationships and the ideas that through the cross we might be reconciled and made whole with each other. And so today, I want us to look through the window, which is our last uh, image, through the window of commerce and the marketplace. Today's understanding of the cross can help us make meaning out of suffering of, in our lives and I think it's very poignant that we look at this today. And where I want us to get to is to answer the question, why did Jesus have to die, with the answer to bring meaning to our suffering and pain and to bring us re a resurrection and hope. God's love is a suffering love and the cross is a symbol of life and hope and the love that can emerge out of suffering. But firstly, let's look at some of the New Testament verses that cluster around this image of commerce and the language of redemption. Redemption in the English translation of the Greek word agorazo. Now you're going to hear all my bad um, Greek online. It's recorded. But it means to purchase in the marketplace. And in ancient times, it often referred to the act of buying a slave. Now this would be a very familiar um, thing that happened in the marketplaces during Palestine at the time. It was common in the Roman Empire to witness the selling of slaves in the marketplace. Through this window, the early Christians made sense of the cross. And so redemption came to mean that Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice and death, purchased believers from slavery of sin and set us free from that bondage. And so we have verses like Romans 3.23 that says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 1 verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace, grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And in Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Another Greek word relating to the word redemption is exadorazo. And redemption involves in this word going from something to something. And in this case, it's Christ freeing us from the bondage of the law to the freedom of a new life in him. And yet we know that our experience of our relationship with Christ is more than a transactional relationship. It's more than a purchase. In the same way that we would find the idea of buying a baby offensive, to limit our faith to just a transactional arrangement seems to be very unspiritual and banal. And so a third Greek word connected with this word redemption is lutro, and it means to liberate. And I want to sit with this word a little as we um, look through this window of redemption. I find this emphasis of the word a more relational one, and it's perhaps one that we see in the book of Ruth. Uh, when Ruth refers to Boaz as her redeemer, the kinsman redeemer was a male relative who, according to the Pentateuch, the law, had the privilege or the responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble or in danger or in need. And so the Hebrew term for kinsman redeemer designates the person who delivers or who rescues. And so Ruth doesn't have the power to own property or to provide for herself, so she calls on Boaz as her kinsman redeemer to provide both land and children, offering her security, a home and a future. And as we see in this story as it unfolds, this arrangement is more than a transaction. It is based on a relational commitment to care for the powerless, for the women in need, and we see that the whole community experiences the joy of the redeemed. See, redemption is an act of God's grace by which God rescues and restores God's people. And it's a common thread that's woven through our scriptures. In the reading from today that Kendall read to us in John, we have the story of Mary anointing Jesus' feet. And Mary anoints Jesus' feet with expensive perfume, and we're told that it's worth about a year's wages. And she wipes his feet with her hair. Interestingly, it is Judas that sees the transaction that is made, and that's all he sees, is a simple financial transaction. But what Mary did was an extravagant and intimate act of love in public. In some cultures today, particularly some Jewish and Muslim cultures, it's an offence to let people see your hair or to have your hair um, shown and so wearing a hijab is a sign of modesty and a sign of respect and so it would have been the same in Mary's culture. The unbinding of one's hair was reserved for your husband. It was something intimate. And so even in our own culture, caressing someone's feet might seem a very intimate act and if we saw someone do it, we might think that's a bit unusual. And so the familiar of Mary's action is quite astounding. It's astonishing and it's uncomfortable for those who see it and even for those who will later on read it. Mary is shameless in her intimacy as she steps far outside the bounds of convention and it teeters on the edge of scandal and perhaps suggests there's something more intimate happening between her and Jesus. And so when Judas Iscariot jumps in and complains, Jesus responds... He recognises what Mary is doing and he says, leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Now we don't know what's happening for Mary, what her thoughts are and why she's doing this, but we read here of Jesus' understanding of what she is doing. Mary is anointing Jesus for the triumphant ride through Jerusalem as king and prepares him for his burial. You see, it was the practice in the time of Jesus to anoint bodies for burial with perfume and spices. And as this, in this practice, as I understand it, 
It always begins with anointing the hands and the feet, the external parts of the body that where we often notice the first signs of death. This story has always captured my heart and my imagination, and it's something profoundly intimate and dangerous about Mary's behaviour. It was her passion, her abandonment, her vulnerability, and they speak to an honesty in her expression of her love for Jesus. There is a knowingness about Mary. And while the other, su- subject, um, other disciples are avoiding the subject of Jesus' death, Mary is anticipating Jesus' death and preparing him for it. it. Mary seems to be the only disciple in the room that actually comprehends what was to come in the next few days. And there must have been some affiliation and connection and, uh, and warmth that Jesus felt by her knowingness. See, Mary's not just aware of what's about to happen to Jesus, but she demonstrates a solidarity with the way of the cross. We know other disciples um, stood against the idea that Jesus would die on the cross. But in this passage, I think we get a glimpse of Mary as someone who has a grasp of the Paschal mystery. She understood that Jesus' death was somehow part of his mission and witness in the world. See, the most central of all Christian mysteries is the mystery of suffering and death and transformation. And Christ is central to our faith and central to Christ is his death and his rising to new life and him entering into a new spirit. We all know the truth of this and yet many of us find it difficult to learn how to live in this mystery there's a story of uh, a man in the book oh, sorry John Shea tells a story in his book stories of faith and he tells the story of a young man who is tending to his dying father and the father is still quite young and he's dying of cancer and the disease which is terminal has literally wasted his body away and now he sits in hospital next to his father clinging to life And each night after work, the son comes to the hospital and sits with him. He holds his father's hand and he watches helplessly as his father suffers. And this goes on for a number of days. And finally, one night, sitting like this, the son says to his father, Dad, just let go. Trust God. Anything has got to be better than this. And within a short time, the father grows peaceful and he dies. And the son realises that he has just given voice to something very important about his faith, an important truth about letting go and trusting God. For this man coached into death by his loving son, Good Friday has just taken place. Like Jesus, he was able to give over his spirit to God. See, the Paschal mystery is the mystery after how we undergo some kind of death that we receive a new life and a new spirit. Jesus, in both his teaching and in his life, showed us a clear paradigm for how this should happen. See, it begins with suffering and death. It moves on to the reception of new life. It spends time grieving the old and taking hold of the new. And finally, only after the old life has blessed us and we've truly let go of it, We're given a new spirit for the life that we're about to live. And we see all of this in Jesus' life, in his Passover from death to life. And there are five clear, distinct moments within the Paschal cycle, and you'll see them on the screen. Firstly, we have Good Friday. It's the loss of life and of real death. Then comes Easter Sunday, where there's a reception of new life. Something new has happened and taken place. And then there's the 40 days. There's a time for readjustment to the new and a grieving for the old. And we see in many of the stories with the disciples, they needed this 40 days to get their head around what was happening here. And the next stage is the ascension. It's the letting go of the old and letting it bless you and refusing to cling to the past. And then we have the experience of Pentecost where there's a reception of a new spirit for the new life that we are now living. See, each of these processes are part of the process of transformation, of dying and letting go so that we can receive a new life. 
And this cycle is not just something we undergo just once, but it's something we go through daily in every aspect of our lives. And at the moment, we are experiencing many deaths in our lives, in our world, in our families. We are having to uh, let go of many things. One of the things that I am struggling with as a sense of grief is people's interpretation of why this uh, coronavirus is happening to us. And one of the deep sadnesses for me is to hear Christians talk about God as sending this to us and punishing us. And uh, I really want to encourage you not to engage in these conversations, not to promote uh, the conversations in your, uh, with your families and friends or on Facebook that says that God is the punisher who is doing this to us to get our attention and we must respond um, with obedience. That is not the Christ of the cross and is not the Christ that we see in these readings today. The Christ of the cross as we know today is the one who suffers with us, who is in the middle of our suffering, who is walking with us, who is grieving our losses with us and offers and promises a new resurrection that is about to come. We are all going through our many little deaths at the moment. And we will also go through many new risings and we will also go through many new Pentecosts where we receive a new understanding, a new spirit, a new hopefulness in order to look at the future. You see, our happiness and our peace and our maturity as Christians depends on our willingness to go through this cycle. And one of the great uh, growth times in my life was coming to terms with this Paschal cycle and seeing it as God's way of renewing me and transforming me. And the more that I have learnt to cooperate with this cycle, the more I have experienced the Spirit of God in, within me. Now the other reading today, which may seem a little unusual for today, it's in the Jewish scriptures, and it recounts the story of the death of David's illegitimate son. It's a difficult story as it does present God as the punisher, the one who brings things against us to teach us. But I don't want to focus on that aspect of the Old Testament and we know that our understanding of Christ reveals God as the God of love. But what I want to look at is um, what happened to David and David's reaction and how he engaged in this Paschal cycle. One day we told that David's son becomes very ill and David, for his part, did what was expected then of a father. He donned sackcloth, he sat in ashes, he prayed and he fasted and he pleaded with God to spare his son. However, we are told that the son dies and immediately upon hearing this, David gets up off the ground, he takes off his sackcloth, he brushes off the ashes, he bathes, he goes to the temple, he prays and then he eats a good meal, sleeps with his wife and conceives Solomon, his son. Now this behaviour strikes his friends as quite odd and they ask David, have you not got things around a little bit backward? While your son was alive, you fasted and prayed, hoping God might spare him. But now that he is dead, there is... Um, sorry, so David... Sorry, now that he is dead, you eat and drink. But David, in his words, uh, explains his behaviour. And he says, when the child was still alive, I fasted and prayed, hoping that God would heal him and save him. Now that he is dead, there is nothing I can do to bring him back. But I am, I am still alive and I must go on living in the face of this and I must continue to create new life. For King David, a certain resurrection has just occurred. His son is dead, but he realises that he is still alive. He's not alive in the same way. He will never be the same again. But he has been changed by his son's death. And with this new life, he begins to move into a new life with some strength. Now, when I consider this Paschal cycle and the lo loss of those I love, um, it's not always difficult to live out what you preach. Learning to be able to come face to face with uh, such uh, destructive deaths can often stunt us and cause us to get stuck in different aspects of the Paschal cycle. But there is a promise of new life and, there's, and learning to embrace the pain and the suffering and to embrace a new life to come is the challenge for us all. The cross, if rightly understood, always reveals a new resurrection. 
It's as if God were holding up the crucifix as a cosmic object lesson to us, saying, I know this is what you're experiencing. Don't run away from it. Learn from it, as I did. Hang there for a while in your crucifixions, and it will be your teacher. And rather than losing your life, you will truly find your life. You will gain a larger life, and this will be the way through. In everyday language, these questions may help us to move us from our deaths to new life. And in a time of lockdowns and shutdowns, this may, these questions may help you process your own grief and um, your own losses at this time. Firstly, I want to I encourage you to take some time to name your deaths. What is it that we need to let go of in this time? What is it that by holding on to and clinging to is stopping us from moving on into life? Secondly, claim your births. What new life, what new thing is coming into your life through this experience? Thirdly, grieve what you have lost and adjust to your new reality. There have been times this week that I have just cried and I think, why am I crying? And it's just a recognition of the losses and the grief. And as Sue and I um, and try and walk with people who are grieving their losses at the moment, it, it can be difficult to deal with your own grief and loss. But we need to take time to grieve them, to acknowledge that things have changed. And the fourth thing is to not cling to the old. We need to accept that things will never be the same for us again after this experience. But let it ascend, let the old ascend and let it give you its blessing so that you're ready to take on the new thing. And fifthly, accept the spirit of life that you, are, the spirit of the life that you are now living. We are already moving into a new way and even in our worship today, this is a new way of being in fellowship together. And it's about accepting this and experience this new spirit that will enliven us. I know many of you have done this and you've sent photos of you uh, watching our worship video with your slippers and your PJs and a cup of tea. Already you're accepting the new life and the new experience. So I want to encourage you to come back to some of these questions as you process what is happening for you in this time. See, as followers of Jesus, we are called to enter into the new life of Jesus' life. And we have to learn how to live and we have to learn how to die and how to take hold of the complexities of life. And this includes our sufferings, our joys, and our tragedies. But it also includes our surprises, and to live hopefully and prayerfully. See, the cross enables us to move from our suffering and our mourning into dancing. And it moves us from sorrow into joy. And in this way, we, we redeem our suffering. Confronting our deaths ultimately allows us to live better and to dance with God's joy amid all the sorrows of the night and to give us hopeful mornings. So as we take our final steps to Good Friday, I pray that we would have the courage to face our deaths so that we might all truly live. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the power of your word that reveals to us the mystery of your grace. It's difficult for us to understand the cross. It's difficult to grasp the depth of love that you have for us that is revealed through Christ on the cross. But today we are reminded that the cross is a symbol of hopefulness, a symbol that our sorrows can be turned to joy and our mourning can be turned to dancing. So God, help us to live in faith to take hold of this paschal mystery, being willing to die so that we might truly live. Amen. Amen. So in response to God's word to us, I invite you to give in the offering. And I know we're not able to do this physically, but many of you have been putting your offerings aside in your envelopes and doing it by um, EFT. I want to encourage you to give as you are able. I know this is a difficult time for us. Um, some of you have already lost work. Um, but as we are able, let's give as the Spirit leads us in our offerings. So 
let's pray. Loving God, we give to you our offerings. For some, it is difficult to give at this time. But we give in faith, knowing that while we are in the midst of darkness and isolation and sickness, that you are still bringing your kingdom to bear on this earth. And so we give of our offering as we give our lives and ask that you will continue to bring your kingdom to earth in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus Christ, healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Be with the doctors and nurses researchers and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected and who put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection and peace. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Whether we are home or abroad, Surrounded by many people suffering from this illness, or only a few, Jesus Christ, stay with us as we endure and mourn, persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. Lord, we pray for our congregation here at CKCC, while we are unable to physically be together. Help us to be creative in the ways we keep in touch, especially with the lonely and elderly. May we know what it truly means to be a good neighbour. We pray for our leaders and ministers who are trying to keep things happening. Thank you for the technology that allows us to do so many creative things to keep in touch. Let's take a moment now to pray for those we know who need a special touch from God today. Now, in unity with all our sisters and brothers, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. him and this one really does fit with the theme of what Janet um, has just shared with us beauty for brokenness hope for despair so let's sing this hymn with hopefulness Compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts. 
this week come change our love from a heart to a from a spark sorry to a flame so the benediction may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit amen <laughs>